her life and mine where we've just whispered out the name of Jesus. Maybe that's the prayer and the length of the prayer is just uttering his name. Uh, he is certainly worth trusting and valuable to us in times like that. Hey, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3, we're going to look at the first 12 verses of this great section of the book. Proverbs, we're working through at least the first half of the book, which is the instruction for how you handle all the Proverbs. And as we're going through, we're mentioning some of those that are in the latter part of the book. But Proverbs chapter 3 is where we'll be today. Begin with me in your Bibles at verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Or be wary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. Now, Lord, we've read your word, and we pray by your grace you would give us the measure to understand it, and the grace to apply it. And we pray, Lord, that would be a glorious way of life for you and the way of wisdom for us that ends with life. Thank you for Jesus, who is the perfection of all these words, and for our rest that we have in him when our faith is placed in him. We pray that his spirit would teach us. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, in this section of Proverbs, we find arguably the most popular and most quoted of all the Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight, or in this translation, will make, your, make straight your paths. That is the central message of the Bible. That is the gospel in the Old Testament. It's the same message in the New Testament as well, that if you want hope for today, if you want hope for eternity, then trust should not be in yourself, trust should be in the Lord it's in him we find hope so we place our trust in him it's the call of the gospel in the Old Testament it's the call of the gospel in the New Testament to put your trust in the Lord rather than in yourself submit your ways to the Lord rather than your own ways make life about the Lord and his way and life will be full and rich so to be blessed in this life and in the life to come, Proverbs says, trust in the Lord. If you want blessings today, if you want blessings in the new heaven and the new earth, then trust in the Lord. Like every gospel-centric book in the Bible, Solomon is leading his son not to modify his behavior, but leading his son to have a transformed heart. He's telling him, let your heart be transformed by having the Word of God inscribed on your heart. Let it be written on your heart. We recognize in this psalm, like we recognize in the rest of the Bible, that only God can do a genuine work in the heart of mankind. You can't change your heart. Your husband can't change your heart. Your wife can't change your heart. Your mom and daddy can't change, although they try. God alone can change hearts, and he does bring transformation to hearts. The way he does that is he gives us a new heart. He makes it that we could be spiritually born from above with a new heart. So Solomon's appeal to his son is to let God, let God's instruction, let God's wisdom work within his heart so that he might be filled with obedience and steadfast love and have faithfulness all the way to the end. Those words loving kindness 
faithfulness, obedience, they're all covenantal words. They are words that are given throughout the covenant of the Old Testament and the covenant of the New Testament in Christ Jesus. Now, I wanted to focus on that this morning, trying to figure out exactly what Solomon is saying to his son and what he's saying to us as well. So let's talk about those terms that are found throughout the covenant. First in Exodus chapter 6 and then moving over to chapter 19, here's God's covenant that he's making with the people all the way back to Exodus. This is rooted, of course, out of his covenant with Abraham. He says, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. That's God's offering to them. You'll be my people and I will be your God. And then he gives this, if indeed you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession among all people. So in the covenant, God says, I'm going to be present. I'm going to be your God and you will be my people. And in that way of relationship, there is an exercise in the relationship, which is requiring obedience in the covenant. And as you are obedient, you will be my treasured possession. And of course, when God gives them that, he gives them the law that, it, that is required when we're in a covenantal relationship with God. His law is given, and the people respond to that law in chapter 19, verse 8, by saying, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So the covenant begins by God saying, I want a relationship, and I want to be yours, and I want you to be mine in this relationship. Here's the way you are to live, which is obedience. And the people say, we agree. We agree to everything that you have called us to do. And then in chapter 20, he says that he would show steadfast love to everyone who loves him and obeys his command. So there is stipulation to this covenantal relationship. In the Old Testament is, you will be my people, I will be your God. Obey me as you as I love you, you ought to be loving me and responding to me in obedience. So it's no wonder to me why Solomon is telling his son not to forget the commands of God, not to forsake the instruction of him, his father. Now, remember, Solomon's instruction is the command of God. It's the word of God. Solomon is just not speaking as a father. He is speaking as a father who has been granted wisdom from God remember Solomon has asked God will you give me wisdom that I might lead these people and God gave him wisdom unlike any other person has ever received it no one was like him before no one is like him since except for Jesus the son of God God incarnate himself so this instruction that he's saying to his son make sure you're holding on to this is the wisdom of God hold on to wisdom so in God's covenant relationship, he requires of Israel obedience, love, and faithfulness. And Solomon is telling his son, be obedient, be faithful, and be full of love. Let that be written on your heart. Now today, we are not called to obey the law of Moses because that law has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. In the new covenant that God has established with us through Jesus Christ, we are to obey the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is summarized in two statements. It is this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love other people to the measure that Christ has loved us. Now, if you're kind of tweaked out about that and you're thinking, hey, Randy, what are you, forsaking all the law? Oh, no, the Lord said, all the law of the Old Testament and the words of the prophets hinge on these two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. So we're in the same vein. This is the covenant that God has established in the Old Testament, the covenant that God established in the New, co uh, in the New Testament, and it is the covenant relationship that you and I have. We're called into the relationship by Christ. And here's what Christ is saying. I want to be your Lord, and I want you to be my people. And I want you to obey me. If you love me, you will obey me. Isn't that what he says? And so we exercise in this covenant that God has established through Christ Jesus, taking our sin upon himself on the cross and dying with that, giving to us and speaking in us his righteousness, giving us a new heart by which he writes the law of God on our heart, 
making it so that we can have a nature from above things that are noble right and true and pure now can be thought of and exercised in and in that relationship that we have with jesus christ this transformation of our heart he says now exercise in that 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 is that is the way that god is working within us right now so a wise person recognizes that he is not to be trusted to set the course of life for himself but instead lets christ set the course of life he trusts in him rather than his own understanding he acknowledges christ in all of his ways and walks in those ways and in this a wise person knows without god's help at seeing things that she will not understand things as they ought to be so she asks god to give her insight to the way she should go and a wise person walks with the wisdom and acknowledgement of God in all the ways of life, trusting that he will make the paths of life straight. The reward of life is that. So the most common question that I get asked in life and in Bible is, Randy, how do I know the will of God? I've got this job opportunity coming up. How do I know what God's will is? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about asking this person to marry me. How do I know what God's will is? Or we're thinking about buying this house. How do I know if it's the will of God to buy that? Can I just remind you that very rarely does God give us specific instruction? I mean, it happens. But most of the time, what God wants us to do is to be rooted in his word so much rooted in his word that we have a biblical worldview in other words we see the world through the bible and as we see the world through the bible we don't trust in our own understanding we lean into the understanding that god has and we take the path of god we take the wisdom of god and we apply it to our life and in that we make wise decisions paul is a good reference in that rarely did god specifically tell paul where to go now he would stop him from going sometimes but rarely would god ever tell paul where he is to preach next what paul did is he went to the city and he went to the city to preach the gospel he knew that's what god's call was and so he's living his life not in his own understanding he's acknowledging god in all of his ways and god is directing his paths through that truth of the bible he'll do the same thing for you you will know the decision to make based on you walking in the path of Christ with the wisdom of Christ. And in, in doing so, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 says that we will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Does that sound familiar to you? That you would find favor with God and man? Does that sound at all familiar? Sure. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, in summary of Jesus' life, he grew in stature, in favor with God and man. Now, let's think about that for a moment, because Jesus is the fulfillment of what Solomon is instructing throughout Proverbs. So the book is written to his son Rehoboam, who is going to be the crown prince, or he is the crown prince. And so he is writing instruction for the king of Israel. This is the way the king of Israel ought to live. But fulfilling this will not be done by Rehoboam. In fact, he's going to do the exact opposite. He's going to go his own direction, in his own paths. He's going to walk in folly. But there is one coming in the future, namely Jesus Christ, who will fulfill every command and every instruction that Solomon gives. He is ultimately the king of Israel and the king of the universe who is perfectly wise in every way. Right, but you and I can have that kind of favor with God and man when we obey and respond in the instruction that God has given us and walk with wisdom. Now, Jesus was perfect in that. From the very beginning, it was that way. Even his parents made sure that Jesus satisfied and fulfilled every requirement of the law. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, verse 39, it says, And when they, his parents, had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Ga into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. If you're one to mark in your Bible, you might just circle that and make a reference to Proverbs. He's filled with wisdom because Jesus is wisdom. 
He's perfect in all ways. And the favor of God was upon him. And then, of course, as he's growing older in his adolescence, he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now, the magnificence of this covenantal relationship that God has established with us is that his presence is with us. That's the glory of Israel. That, that I'm going to be your God and you will be my people and I will dwell. You remember when God told them to build the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and he positioned it in the camp? You remember where he positioned his presence? Right in the middle of the tribes. He wanted right in the middle. And that was a way of saying that I am choosing in this covenant relationship to be in the midst of you. That's the glory of this new covenant that we have in Christ Jesus. That he doesn't camp with us. He lives within us. Right in the midst of us. He goes where we go. He goes through the trials with us. He goes through the joys with us. He is in the midst of us. So this great covenant relationship, God says, I'll take you as my people and I will be your God. And in the covenant relationship that we have with Christ Jesus, he says, you will be a people for my possession 1 Peter chapter 2. And the Bible ends with a glorious promise. In the next to the last chapter, he says that we will be with him and he with us. We will be his people. What a, what a magnificent promise we have given to us in Christ. So when we understand that, when we understand the covenant that God has established for us and what he is affording to us, we respond, and I think this is what Solomon is telling his son, we respond in this way, Lord, I surrender my life to you, transform my heart, and write your law on my heart. Transform me from the inside out. See, that's, that's the work of Christ. Christianity is not us doing good in our own strength. Christianity is us coming to the conclusion we cannot be good. We fall desperately short of that. God, make us new. Make us new from above. Make us to be born not of human determination. Make us to be born of spiritual determination. Make us to be born from above. Make us with a heart that you can actually inscribe on our heart and give us grace that we might be able to walk in the way of obedience with you, walk in wisdom. God makes it so that that's possible. All right, so but what Solomon is doing for his son is saying, work in a way that your heart has the law written on it. What you and I have is a, is a greater advantage. You and I have, God, give us a new heart that you can write on. And he does. That's the glory of the gospel. He gives us a new heart. But now, if you notice in chapter 3, in these Proverbs, the way that they're written in this chapter and in many other places in Proverbs, you find that there's obligation. In every covenant relationship, there is obligation. And in the covenant relationship that God has with Israel, there are, there's obligations that Israel has and there's obligations that God has. And in this way, Solomon is telling his son, there's obligation that you have and there's obligation that God has. So in all the odd verses that I read for you, 1, 3, 5, 7, and all the way through, all those are the son's obligations. And in all the even verses, 2, 4, 6, 8, and on, that's all of God's obligations. So you, you're reading this in a rhythm of son obligation, God obligation. Son obligation, God obligation. And I think that we, can, we can grow some insight from that. Let's just walk back through that. I've given it to you in this way in your handout, so you might make little notes along the side if you'd like to. Here's the son's obligation in the first verse. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Now remember, anytime Solomon is saying, my teaching and my commandments, those come from God. God has given those to him. Remember, Solomon says, I'm like a young child. I don't know how to go in and come, come back in. I don't know how to go out and come back in. I, I'm just so simple. Lord, how am I going to ever lead this nation of yours? And God says, because you didn't ask me for riches, because you didn't ask me for power and prestige, I'm going to give you wisdom and all that stuff. And so everything that Solomon is instructing his son is coming from God. Now here's, here's what the son's obligation is. Listen, pay attention, don't forget, let it be on your heart. In fact, let it change who you are, this instruction. 
for the length of days and the years of life and peace they will add to you now there's one thing that we need to recognize in the promises of god they are often given to us in great measure in this life but they are always given in full measure in the life to come so there are promises that are true today but fully true in heaven this is one of those uh, Kay's mother died before she was 50 years old and I can tell you as the Lord is my witness I've never met a more saintly person she had been and was in a process of being sanctified in the image of Christ and she demonstrated that like nobody else that I ever knew she had the disposition of the Lord Jesus she by the promise of God ought to have lived long days and years but those days and years were cut short and if you don't understand the scripture in the timeless nature of God then you'll misunderstand events like that in life this is given to us in some measure today but fully in the measure of heaven my mother-in-law was absent in her body at the age of 49 present with her lord and she lives today as i live today she is not with body but one day her body will be resurrected out of her grave in sullivan alabama and it will be glorified and be made eternal and her years will last forever that promise is given to her it's given to us now generally speaking this holds true if you obey your father's instruction and your father's instructions come from god the father generally you are going to live longer in other words if you are not sexually permissive you have zero chance of having an std if you are not drinking and driving you have zero chance of driving drunk and dying <laughs> if you follow the instruction of your father and your father's instructions come from the lord your days will be lengthened and they will be with peace the word there is shalom what he is saying there is your life in the days that God has given to you, in the years that God has given you, if you follow the instruction of God, your life will be at peace. And that is a, an Eden-like way of living. In Eden, there was shalom. Peace with God, peace with self, peace with others, peace with creation. What he's saying is, if you will obey my commands, the instructions that I'm giving to you, then you will be at shalom with God. You will be shalom with self, made in the image of God, given the new heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be in shalom with others because God will fill your heart with love and you'll demonstrate that love to other people. You'll be in shalom with creation, coming alongside of the work of Christ, reconciling all things unto himself. It's a principle for today that is fulfilled in eternity. Secondly, he says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you bind them around your neck write them on the tablet of your heart now again you and i have a vantage that uh, solomon's son rehoboam did not have and that god has given us a new heart by faith and we can have him inscribe on our heart but what he's saying to his son solomon is let god work in your heart let his word be binding to you so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. A transformed heart in a covenant relationship with God brings the favor of God and the blessings of mankind. There are people in my life that I think of who were centered in the word of God. I, I, I'm thinking of uh, Bernice Rule right now who was just a woman who was centered in God. I did not ever talk to Miss Rule that she did not quote scripture to me. Or she would tell me things like, oh, pastor, preach the word and save the people. In other words, the salvation of people is going to come in the preaching of the word. I can just 
hear her and see her and know the expression i can tell you people like that in my life have the favor of god and they have my favor as well i wanted to be around her are we those kind of people that have determined to let god write his word on our heart to be faithful to that word to bind his word around our neck to not take it off when we're at work to not take it off when we're behind closed doors but leave the word of god on us at all times and let its expression be in our words in our decisions in our purposes and in our intentions and at that we'll have favor with god and with mankind and then of course this famous verse that you know so well about trusting the lord let's let's just read that out loud maybe you have it memorized i i memorized it a long time ago in another translation uh, but we'll read it out of this translation let's read it together trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not oh see it just comes out lean not i'm sorry let's start it again trust in the lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and here's god's obligation in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths you trust him you acknowledge him you go in his direction rather than yours and he will make your path straight that's that biblical worldview that i mentioned earlier if you want to know where to go if you want to know who to date you want to know that decision this decision trust in the lord don't take the own understanding let me see what i ought to do have the biblical worldview what would jesus be doing in light of what i know about him what would god command me to do if i could audibly hear his command knowing what i know about his word does this demonstrate in any way a love for god with all my heart soul mind and strength does this in any way demonstrate a love for people like christ has loved me does this demonstrate in any way the word of christ does this help in any way for the nations to know the name of christ those are the decisions or the questions that you ask in the midst of the decision and god will make straight your paths god will make it so that you can walk in his way and be not wise in your own eyes fear the lord and turn away from evil and here's what he says it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones a life that is lived reverently to god and purposefully in the way of god away from evil that is a healthy life that's a life that is not plagued with the unhealthy consequences of sin it's a life that prospers in the way of god contrast that with a life that bears the consequences of sexual sin the consequences of overeating the consequences of being lazy the consequences of over drinking the consequences of over spending and all those other things that solomon tells his son in proverbs compare and contrast if you're going to live in the way of folly you're going to have the consequences of folly if you're going to live in the way of wisdom you're going to have the good consequences of wisdom and many of those consequences are physical they're emotional they're financial they're relational and they are spiritual so he's reminding him do it in this way and you will prosper do it in that way and you will falter even in your body trusting in god and being transformed by him reverses the consequences of sin the curse of sin it occurs ultimately in the new creation of heaven and earth but every now and then we have glimpses of that restoration now there's people in this room that Kay and I specifically pray for on a regular basis throughout the week. We know of your diagnosis. We know of your financial challenges. We know of the relational breaking apart. We know of the sin. We know of the rejection. Now, not all of you, but those who you have told us what's going on in your life, it is not uncommon for the mornings that we're gathered together reading god's word praying through god's word that we pray in earnest for you we call out to god on your behalf and we're calling for for the healing we're calling for a reconstitution of healing and health in your life we're ca we're calling for strength to be given again to you some of you are asking us to do that and we are joining you can we just be reminded as a faith family this is what we do we pray for one another 
we recognize that we are one body and if one part of our body is not healthy in some way then it affects the totality of the body today at the end of the service we're going to have a unique time of prayer where i'm going to invite you who long for the faith family to be praying over you and with you i'm going to invite you to come forward and be prayed over there's not going to be anything mystical about it there's no supernatural power that's given at this time above any other time listen god hears the prayer when it will happen at noon day today and he will hear when it happens tomorrow morning at 7 a.m at my house but we will do it together as a way to signify that we are asking god for a glimpse of what is going to happen in the new heaven and the new earth where we will be given bodies that are glorified without the effect of sin and the curse of sin, a body without disease, a body without sickness. We will be given wealth as being a co-heir with Christ Jesus, and we will never have another day that we think, will we have ends meet based on the income that we have? We will be in perfect relationship and harmony with each other, living as shalom with every person in heaven. There won't be any contrast in relationship. There will not be any fault. There will not be any sin. What we're asking for when we ask God to restore and heal and right and bring blessing, what we're asking for is that glimpse. We're not asking for the fulfillment today because all of us are going to die. It's appointed for us to die one day and after that, judgment. We're recognizing that everything that is temporary in this world is going to be burned away. So we're not asking for the fulfillment of all that today. We're asking for glimpses of what is ultimately fulfilled. Our hope is not being fulfilled in the temporary life. Our hope is being eternally healed in the life to come. But we ask, and when we see it, when God heals, and we have seen God heal, and when God provides in a miraculous way, we get a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like one day. And it causes us to long for him all the more. And then he says, honor the Lord with your wealth and your first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now, in an agriculture-based economy, which was the case in this age of time, Solomon recognized wealth is not in your 401k wealth is not in your iras wealth is not in your savings account your cds wealth is in your barn and your vats being full if your barn is full that means you've had a good harvest and you have stored the treasure in the barn if your vats are full that meant that the grape harvest was good and you've been able to process that and you have an abundance of wine and that is the economy the agri-economy of the day but look what he says, because this is so odd. The way of folly says, if you want full barns, you better store all you can have and keep all that you have. In the wisdom of God, he says, give me the first fruits. To me, this is like a test to Solomon's son. If you're going to go in your own understanding, you will always hoard. You will always want more. You'll always push hard to have more. If you're going in the way of wisdom, give me the first fruits. How many of you have ever grown squash in your life? Anybody? That's, that's a good thing to admit to. Don't be timid about that. Squash is a good plant to grow. It's a fairly easy plant to grow. But around my house, when we grow squash, the best squash comes at the beginning of the harvest. Because in Alabama, we have this invader called squash bugs. And squash bugs like squash as much as you and I like squash. And the July and the summer heat, uh, August heat, bear down on a squash plant, and it really struggles in the heat when the sun is, is bearing down like that. So the first fruits are the best. When Kay and I are pulling in squash, cutting it and putting it up, we want as much as we can get in the beginnings because we know that it's going to taper way off in the end. All right, now think about that challenge. The first fruits are always the best. It is what is in hand, so you know you got it. The second fruit 
is always less, and you really don't even know if you're going to get it. So when we give out of the first fruits, we're saying to God, I recognize, Lord, that my trust is in you. It is coming to conclusion, all I had in my hand was some dead seed. And I put it in the ground, and by miracle, you caused that dead seed to come to life. And you brought a plant from that, and from the plant came fruit, so that one seed turns into hundreds, and sometimes, depending on the plant, thousands of seeds. Only you can provide that kind of abundance, God, in the rhythm of your creation. So I recognize that, and I'm trusting, Lord, that you will provide for me. I give you my best and my first. Now, we don't live in an agriculture-based economy, at least not here in Gadsden, Rainbow City, Southside, Hoax Bluff, Glencoe. But we do live in an economy where God can get first fruits. And so as I was paying bills over the weekend, among the first fruits was a tithe check, one tenth of my income. Our livelihood was written right back to the Lord through Meadowbrook, and we gave an overage to that in offerings and to the building fund. And we're trusting God. We recognize that all things belong to you, all things are coming back to you. You have given to us fruit, and we are giving back to you as a reminder to us that all things belong to you and we need this exercise can i just tell you that i want every one of those dollars can i just tell you that i struggle at times to write the check because i'm thinking i really would rather have this for me but i'm choosing not in those moments to trust in my own understanding i'm acknowledging god in that way i'm writing the check and i gave it at the eight o'clock hour this morning and what god is saying when we do that he will give us more who can be trusted with more but the one who has proved to be dependable with what he first had this is an exercise do you trust god Giving is an exercise of trust. And then he finally says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as the Father, the Son, in whom he delights. So you ought to know, and I ought to know, that God is going to discipline us, and he's doing so not because he's coming against us, but because he's coming for us. He's building us up. He's shaping us. He's crafting us. He's making us more in the image of of his beloved son jesus all right so god blesses the wise and the, and the obedient in a good measure today and in perfect fullness for all eternity now if you don't get that if you don't get that summary statement then you're going to begin thinking in this little wacky prosperity gospel thing that's going on in the u.s and we have propagated around the world and it doesn't hold true if you're thinking that god this is a formula if you do this god will do that you're thinking wrong it's a formula that works for all eternity. If you do this, God will do that. The fullness of it is in eternity. And every now and then we have glimpses of that goodness throughout this life. We're praying for those glimpses even today. All right, let's move forward. Communicating this is so important. Solomon is doing it for a couple of different reasons. Number one, he's communicating as a father to the son. If you're a father, if you're a mother then God requires of us in Deuteronomy 6 to teach the commands of God to our children. In that way, grandparents can speak God's truth to grandchildren, and we ought to do that. And Deuteronomy chapter 6 tells us exactly how to do that. When you're coming in, when you're going out, when you're sitting down, when you're rising up. Put it over your house, put it in your house, put it on the doorway. Remind each other always of it. So Solomon is doing that when he's saying to his son, here's the instruction of God. Let it be written on your heart and bind it around your neck because that's what a dad, that's what a mom ought to do. But he's also saying it as a, as a king to his son. And so as a king to his son, he recognizes that God has instruction for the king. He tells him this, go to that next slide if you will, that this is what it shall be for all the kings. Have the book of the law and read it every day. Let it direct you. All right, so we don't have kings in the U.S. 
but man, do we ever wish the president and our leaders would have God's holy book and read it every day and let their direction of our country be from God's word. Wouldn't we love that? All right, what about your boss? What about the employer of your company? What about the board members? What about you? If it's good for King Israel to have the book of the law and judge and communicate and lead out of the book of the law, don't you think it's important for us to lead in such a way from God's book? Yeah, sure. Now, I don't know if this is going to pass, but I had a gentleman come up to me after the first service and he said, Randy, I've ordered this study Bible app for my phone and I put it off as a management expense in my company because you said I ought to read God's word and know it so that I can lead my company in that way. If you can get that by the IRS or the state revenue, go for it. But he got the right concept that if he's going to lead his business well, he better be reading God's word well and applying that word in his life and leading from that. I think that's what Solomon is doing. He's, in, he's helping communicate God's truth. I wish I could tell you that Solomon did that all the way of his life, but he didn't. He started out with the wisdom of the Spirit, and he started out on a journey of wisdom. But he didn't end that way. In fact, somewhere along the way, Solomon allowed folly to take over his life. And where God had one mystery for man, a man was to leave his father and mother, come together with a wife. The two would become one. That mystery would point to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somewhere along the way, Solomon went in his own direction and ended up with a couple of hundred wives and 700 concubines. He obliterated that illustration from the past. Somewhere along the way, Rehoboam determined that he knew what was best. The first thing he did is the crown prince, when he became king, was he asked for wisdom. And the king's seasoned advisors came to him and gave him wisdom. And he said no to them. And he went to his peers, the young guys, and heard from them. And they led him astray. He took the path of folly. I wish you could tell you that Solomon and Rehoboam ended well, but they did not apply the wisdom of God. And it cost them, and it cost a whole lot of people as well. Do you know the kingdom divided because Solomon's choice to walk in folly? Rehoboam brought great division among the 12 tribes so that they became 10 and 2 and were divisive and hostile against God and sometimes against each other. I wish I could tell you that it turned out well, but it didn't. You see, what God has done is he has created us in his image, and in that image he's made it so that our hearts can love him and love righteousness and love his commands. But in the midst of that, he also gave us a free will where we can determine whether we want to walk in wisdom of God or folly of mankind. Adam and Eve and everybody subsequent to them chose their own understanding rather than the understanding of God. They chose a path of folly rather than wisdom, and so have you and I. The Lord says we have hearts of stone We've hardened ourselves against God's commands. But my friends, the gospel, the good news, is that Christ came to provide for us a covenant where he says, I want to be, you, you are my possession and I want to be your God. I want to give you a new heart, not a heart of stone, but a heart that is pliable. I want a heart that I can inscribe my law on. I want to put my law in your heart to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love other people like I have loved you. I want you to have that kind of heart. And that transaction began on the cross of Calvary where Jesus took all of our unrighteousness upon himself and he bore the weight of all of the justice of God against that sin and he paid sin's cost there as he was bleeding out and breathing his last so that you and I might be forgiven 
of our lawlessness. And then the great exchange took place in the resurrection where he says that we can have resurrected life spiritually born from above so that we can have a new heart. And in that heart, he would live by his nature and his commands would be obeyed by the power and the strength of his spirit. That's the glory of the gospel. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. Which will we take? Will we stay on a path of folly in our own understanding, doing life as we want to do it? I can tell you, as Solomon told his son, it will end in destruction. Or will we begin a journey of a new heart, walking in wisdom to the commands of God? That ends in prosperity, genuine prosperity. Which will it be for you? Would you bow your head, please, and close your eyes? The Lord Jesus has lived up to every obligation of righteousness that was required for holiness. And he's willing to credit that to you and me who would be willing to forsake our way for his way. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, it might be that today is the day that you're willing to move forward in faith, to receive Christ, and to be born again from above, not of man, but born of God. Father, in this great exchange that Jesus has for us, righteousness for unrighteousness, judgment for freedom, we receive by faith the work of Christ, the love that you have demonstrated in one who has died in our stead. We renounce the sin and the folly of our own way of living. We renounce that our judgment is right. We renounce our own understanding. We trust not in the way we would live life, but we lean from this day forward on Jesus Christ. We trust in him alone who can make us right and whole. We trust in him alone who can forgive us of our sins for he had no sin. We trust him for new life. And we pray that you would inscribe on our hearts the new nature of the law of God and that we would have all to obey it and walk beautifully in it. We pray it would bring honor and glory to Jesus and would be blessed by those around us. I pray this in the name of Jesus.